already full and complete and mature. But, but the more you use it, the okay. more confidence yeah. you get that yeah. you can do okay. it, that it's going to work for you. Yeah. It's always going to work for you. That's the constant. Yeah. But you have to learn that that's true by, by experiencing it, by applying your faith. So is that where people fall short? What do you mean? By, because they don't use it? Well, I, absolutely. You're, you're yeah. not going to get anywhere if you don't well, apply your faith. You're saying, you're saying you, you need to grow your faith. So to grow your faith, just like your example of doing exercises to, to become stronger. So if you use it more, you're going to grow it. And I'm actually saying the opposite of that. You do? Yeah. So let's look at the very okay. first chapter. Let's look at the very first paragraph because I think he explains it really clearly in this first paragraph. In your spirit, well, let me back up and say one statement. In the book, you've already got it. We have, have learned this concept, and Andrew Womack weaves it through every single one of his books, that it is easier to receive something that you already have than trying to get something that you don't yet have, right? So what I'm saying to you, Pastor Kenny, is God's already given us the fullness of his faith in us. So it's not that we have to chase after it and grow it and get more of it. We already have it in fullness. We just have to learn how to release it. So I'm going to read that statement one more time. It is easier to receive something you've are, that you already have than trying to get something that you don't yet have. So let's, um, who's reading, Stace? Are you reading? Sure. Okay, go ahead. In your spirit, you have the complete measure of faith. You don't need more faith from God because you already have all you'll ever need. Your faith isn't small, immature, or in the process of growing. It's already as perfect and complete as the faith of Jesus. You just need to renew your mind and learn to release it. Okay, I'm going to have you read that paragraph one more time, because this is like the key point of the whole chapter, and I just really want to drive it home. In your spirit, you have the complete measure of faith. You don't need more faith from God because you already have all you'll ever need. Your faith isn't small, immature, or in the process of growing. It's already as perfect and complete as the faith of Jesus. You just need to renew your mind and learn to release it. So that idea of lifting weights... I'm saying is incorrect if, it, if somebody's applying that idea to growing your faith because you don't have to grow your faith you already have the complete faith of God what you're growing though is your your confidence that it's going to work right okay. clear as mud clear <laughs> okay. when I first become serious about God I started hungering to see in my life and what what I saw in the lives of Bible characters when I read things in the Word, I knew they weren't just for the people back then. Even though I hadn't seen any of those things manifest prior to that time, I knew in my heart they were for me now, too. Since faith is what releases the supernatural ability of God, I began a quest to start operating in His kind of faith. Of course, I misunderstood a number of things at first. I thought faith was something to be obtained. I believed that I had to do things after being saved in order to make God give me more faith. Because of this, I felt my faith was inadequate. Every time I came up against a problem, I just embraced such reoccurring thoughts as, faith works, but I just don't have enough of it. And what I've got is too human. That was my attitude. However, through this revelation of spirit, soul, and body, the Lord cleared up my misunderstandings about faith and revolutionized my life and ministry. Faith was a gift, too. Sometimes a passage of scripture becomes so familiar that you can only see one application of it. Unless you allow the Holy Spirit to shine additional light on that part of his word, you'll be stuck with only the understanding you already have. I'm not suggesting reading something into God's word that isn't there, but I'm recommending that you stay humble before your teacher, the Holy Spirit, as we take a closer look at some very familiar scriptures. John 14:26. The way you were born again is the way you received everything in the Christian life, by grace through faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8-9 Salvation is everything God provided through Christ's atonement. It's not just when you first walk through God's door by receiving forgiveness of sins and a brand new spirit. Salvation is everything in his house as well. Healing, deliverance, prosperity, joy, peace, love, anything you receive from him, all these salvation benefits come the same way you were born again, by grace through faith. Colossians 2, 6 agrees, declaring, As we have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, 
How did you receive Christ? By grace through faith. How then do you walk in him and enjoy all the benefits of his salvation package? By grace through faith. Many people interpret Ephesians 2.8 too narrowly by limiting the word saved to mean only the initial born-again experience. However, the Greek word for salvation here is zozo, sozo, which includes every aspect of salvation. Therefore, Ephesians 2.8 really says, For by grace are ye sozo, forgiven of sins, born again, made righteous, healed, delivered, prospered, etc., through faith. Others miss the fact that it's not only salvation that is not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. Ephesians 2 through 8. It's also faith as well. God not only provides the salvation you need, but he also supplies the very faith you use to appreciate his grace. Both salvation and the faith to receive it are gifts from God. Okay, I'm going to give you a little math uh, equation. I think it's helpful to understand what he just said in that section by seeing, seeing it maybe um, outlined a little bit different way. So this is what I used to think, that salvation, and this is based on the scripture Ephesians 2.8, right? Yeah, Ephesians 2.8. Um, for by grace are you saved. Wait, wait. Wait, where, where does he have it all written out? Does he have it? Um, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Yeah, where is that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. For by grace ye are saved through faith. So I used to think that salvation equals the grace of God or his provision plus faith. So remember when we defined faith, I don't know, several chapters ago, and we were talking about the problem of evil. I think it was that same time. And we were talking about how when you receive salvation... You can't just go to a church service where somebody's preaching the salvation message and repeat the prayer, but not have in your heart a receptive, that your heart isn't receptive to it. If you've closed your heart down and you're just saying it to be a part of the group, you don't receive salvation. Your heart has to be open and receptive. It has to be a free will choice for you to receive salvation. So I used to think salvation is grace, what God provided for me, and my faith to receive it. That's how you get saved. By the grace of God, he provided salvation, plus my faith. If I attach my faith to the grace that God gave, then I can get saved. That's the equation. That's how I thought this used to flow. But now I understand. Oh, this isn't going to work. Right. That's okay. Um, now I understand that salvation equals, okay, you know how when you multiply, can you guys see this? I don't have my thing, my big yeah. board. Okay. You know how when you multiply, there's an order of operations, right? Mm -hmm. So anything in the parentheses, if it's a multiplication problem, you have to multiply it towards both factors, and then you add them together. That's the correct order of operations. So salvation is actually a gift, but so is grace and so is faith. So if you, I were to write this out as a math equation, I would say grace is a gift from God, and, salvation, and faith is a gift from God. So salvation is a gift, grace plus faith. So, am I explaining this clearly? I'm just going to let you look at the equation because I feel like I'm stumbling over my words here. I hear what you're saying. Grace yeah. is a gift. Mm -hmm. But the faith of God is also a gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. I used to think it was up to me to apply my faith. But actually, what we're learning in this chapter is it's my faith has very little... The only time that your faith was applied to any of this was at the time of salvation when you made a free will choice because you can't believe... When you don't understand salvation, how can you have faith in it? When you, are, when you are new and you didn't know God, how could you apply faith to something that you didn't know or understand? So to say faith at the moment of salvation, it, I think it's more better defined as just having a receptive heart, that you are made a free will choice to be open to receive salvation. Can anyone tell me that you understood what salvation meant the day that you received Jesus? So what you're saying is he's so gracious that he even gives you the faith to believe in him. That's right. First of all, How could you use your own faith for salvation when you didn't even know what that meant? Right. Right. At the time of salvation. No, so I'm saying to you exactly what Eric just said is God gave you his faith and he also gave you his grace and salvation means the grace of God which was Jesus on the cross which was the, the mode by which we are saved through the shed blood of the cross, right? That's the grace of God. But he also gave us his faith to receive it. So, I'm going to 
Miller, I think he goes into a little bit more detail in the chapter, but I just wanted to preface the, this discussion with this idea that we didn't even really use our own faith because our, you know, spirit, soul, and body, right? We're a three-part being. We know that we have a physical, carnal mind because that's like the control center of how our flesh works. Our mind tells our eyelids to blink and our lungs to breathe and, you know, helps us to make decisions. But we also have the mind of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that we have the mind of Christ. How can we have the mind of Christ in our natural mind? You can't. That's right. The mind of Christ is actually in your spirit. But the word says we have the mind of Christ because we can draw out of our spirit man and have it revealed or have our carnal mind enlightened right. to the mind of Christ. The same is true when you talk about faith. It's kind of multifaceted, or actually two. There's two sides to it. Do you have a human faith? Remember, didn't we talk about this chapter where we talked about the stop and go light and sitting in the chair and how you have physical senses that assess things? I think mm -hmm. that's like Darn! See, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> That'll be in the next chapter. I read it, though, so I know what you mean. Okay, so we'll get there then. But I'll just give you a, a little... It's in this chapter. Is it? it it's already in this chapter? I, yeah, I, I yeah it, it comes up. Well. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. Human faith. Okay, so I'm going to shut up, and we're going to keep reading, and then it's all going to come together, and it's going to be beautiful. Go ahead. But can, I just, can I just say something yeah. about what you were trying to bring out in salvation with grace and faith being a gift? Yes. God. So it's not really our faith that really did it. It, it is supernaturally through God's faith, but we were receptive. We, we opened our heart and we were receptive to it. Right. I'm saying the faith that Ephesians 2, 8 is referencing isn't human carnal faith. It was the faith of God. And so I think it'll come together the more we read. But yes, I'm saying that the, your free will act to receive Christ at salvation couldn't have been out of human faith because how can you have faith in something that you can't see? Human faith is based on what you can see, and feel, touch, hear in your senses. Mm -hmm. Salvation is totally abstract. So your human faith doesn't have the capacity to believe in something that it can interact with. So it had to have been the faith of God in the, in the salvation message because we know that the word of God is full of his faith. Every word of God has God's faith in it. That's how he created the world. He said, let there be light. That happened, the action of the light happening was a result of the faith of God through his spoken word. So when you say the salvation prayer, right, you have to believe in your heart and say with your mouth, you're actually speaking the faith of God, and that's what's at work in your heart to receive salvation. And that faith of God is really applicable for everything. Absolutely. That's what it is. It's not your own faith. Well, there's two facets, right? You, if you're approaching it, we're going to read about this in a couple sections. Okay, if you're approaching sorry. a chair, yeah, yeah. I, you make observations about that chair before you sit human. in it. Yes. That's that's right. okay. Yes. So I'm saying you can operate in human faith. Oh, yeah. I am saying that's you absolutely true. can. But when it comes to spiritual things, spiritual. you're operating in God's faith. Yeah. Okay. God's word contains his faith. You can't receive salvation without hearing the word. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You might not hear it quoted chapter and verse, but the truths and concepts that are in God's word must come across your path somehow. You need to know that Jesus died for your sins, and because of his love, he offers forgiveness independent of your actions. His only demand is that you believe. Faith comes through hearing the word. How? God's word contains his faith. When you receive the word into your heart, you're receiving God's supernatural faith. You must hear the word be because that's how you believe and receive. God put his faith in his words. When those words are preached, they contain faith. If you will open up your heart, that faith will enter in and produce salvation. 1 Peter 1, 23-25 The faith you use to receive salvation is not merely a human faith, but God's own supernatural faith which came to you through his word. It's important to know whether your faith is natural or supernatural. If you believe that your faith is just a human faith, the devil will be able to convince you that it's not very good. He'll tell you it's puny, weak, frail, and small in amount and strength. 
But when you understand that the faith you're using is God's supernatural faith, which was imparted to you through his word, your level of confidence and expectation will rise. It's not only the faith you use to become born again, but it's the faith you use to appreciate appropriate everything in the Christian <coughs> life. Since God's faith is a supernatural faith, it produces supernatural results. It has the ability to do things that will take you beyond just the physical realm. If you believe you're using just a human faith for the Christian life, you'll only be able to receive natural results. However, when you receive, I'm sorry, when you realize that it's God's faith you're using, you'll start experiencing supernatural results. Okay, so when you're talking about um, somebody like Pastor's son-in-law who was um, showing physical signs that his body was dying, if she were to use her human, fi human faith in that situation, she would be dominated by her environment, what she could see, taste, feel, hear, touch. She was seeing the physical manifestation of death in his flesh. And so her human faith, which we're going to further define in the next chapter, can only relate to what it can interact with. But in order for her to change that situation and change the condition of his body and turn it around, she had to switch off the human faith and get over into her spiritual faith, her God faith, God given faith. Because that's the supernatural faith that can take natural situations and change them into what to align with what the Spirit of God says about that situation. So, the right use of, use of faith is not to exercise it to develop it. It is simply to agree with God and expect the results to line up with the authority of his word. So you look at a physical situation, and if it is not in line with what you know the word says, then the, your job is to use God's faith, which is in his word, that's why you need to speak his word to activate his faith over the situation, and then you just expect that that situation is going to align with what the word of God says. So whose report will you believe? Your human faith, which you can see in front of you, or the report of the Lord, which you can see in the word. Mm -hmm. And your job is to stand and expect and not walk away until you see what's, see your situation align with the word. Okay. So that's why it's that it takes the pressure off, right? Because it's not about you or your performance or what you can do in your ability. It says, when you understand that the faith you're using is God's supernatural faith, which was imparted to you through his word, your level of confidence and expectations will rise. Because the pressure's off of you and your ability. It's just putting your faith in the authority of the word of God and in his faith. If you want a circumstance to change and you say you speak it, wouldn't you also say that you have to believe in your heart just like when you came to salvation? It's the same thing that even though you're speaking it, you have to believe in your heart that there is going to be some change or there is going to be um, whatever it is that you're, you're bringing to the Lord. You know, just like when we came to salvation, you can speak the words, they, mean it. they don't mean anything unless you believe in your heart that at that moment, you know, because... So I have to further qualify that Ooh. statement because... Yes, you have to be settled in your heart that the word of God is true and that God's faith can change anything. But when you're praying over a situation that involves other people, then can you stand and expect change? Absolutely. But does that mean... Okay, hold on. But what if you don't believe in your heart? I mean, you just speak words, but you don't really have a belief in your heart. You know, you speak it and you say, boy, I hope that works. You know, I mean, there's, it's like there's unbelief. Okay, so double-mindedness comes later, doesn't it? Because I think we just read that chapter like two weeks ago. I think so. Yes, it's in chapter 14. We're going to get there to double-mindedness, where it speaks about you can have faith in God about something, and you can have unbelief in your heart about that same thing at the same time. And the idea is as soon as you get to a place where the teeter-totter favors your faith, rather than your unbelief, then you'll start to experience success in that area. So is it possible to have faith and unbelief in the, in the same subject at the same time? Absolutely. It's called being double-minded. And so the idea is to facilitate single-mindedness, meaning believing that the word of God is the authority and that the faith of God has the authority and whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. That's how you get into single-mindedness 
And so your um, as your um, to basically beat down your unbelief and exalt your belief so that it can work for you. But I do have to say that I, don't, I think it's dangerous to have a broad statement about <coughs> believing in your heart that something's going to happen because when you're praying over a situation that involves the free will of other people, then there's other variables well, that you can't control. Even if it's not, not the free control. will of other people, I think we still need to believe in our heart and actually then there's a battle in your mind and you need to reject those thoughts that Satan puts at you and stay in belief in this situation. Mm -hmm. You know, um, That's personally how I believe that. But I think maybe it was just the way you said it that I mis misinterpreted what you were saying because I think I heard the word, something along the lines of... Um, believe in your heart that it's true or, or something like that. And what I thought you were saying was that what you want to happen or what you want to come to pass, do you ha don't you have to believe in your heart that that's going to happen? And I, I was just trying to make the discernment between what you have to believe in the heart is the authority of the word. Because sometimes we can believe that something's going to happen a certain way, but it may or may not be the will of God. So knowing what... Ephesians 5, 17, do not be unwise, but know what the will of the Lord is. First, we have to know what that the will of the Lord is. I remember Kenneth Copeland talking about um, a situation where he had to pray over something. And he was struggling because he didn't know what to say. Like, he knew he wanted to pray about the situation, but he didn't know what prayer he should say. So he said, I, I just stopped and I prayed in the Spirit to wait to hear from the Holy Spirit. And I got a revelation that we should never pray over a situation until we first ask what the words should be, what our prayer should be. Like if I say, um, I'm trying to think of something kind of dumb, but if I say, well, sure, anything that contradicts the word, you know. So is that what you're saying? Like we can pray about things that we want to happen, but the if you read the okay. word, it's contradictory to the word. So as an example. Like I told you before, I'm reading about end times signs, the signs of the end times, right? And the other day I was feeling really discouraged, like um, about the mask mandate. I'll just use that as an example. Mm -hmm. Because in my heart, I, you know, there's a saying, uh, like a meme going around that says something like, um, um, I don't remember the first word, but it said something like, um, the right way to do things is to inhibit the movement of sick people in order to keep them healthy and not expose them to external risk, but it's tyranny to, to inhibit the movement of healthy people. So like this idea that healthy people can't be about moving around doing their business without wearing a mask is, is ludicrous because we have a, a constitutional right, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, that we should be able to walk around and do our thing if we're healthy and not be under these the control of this government or whatever that's saying that if you're healthy you have to wear a mask and you can't go to public place. you know what I mean mm -hmm. so this uh, this what I'm trying to say is it's reversing of what the Constitution says is right is one way but the way that our society is moving right now is flipping that and saying you don't have those constitutional rights and you have to wear a mask if you're healthy it doesn't make any sense I'm really torn in my heart because I know we have constitutional liberties and how can our local government our local elected government who's supposed to abide by the Constitution how can they be overstepping it and completely reversing it with these mandates? Okay, so I was getting discouraged about this the other day because I was thinking, and our, our elected, um, in the state of Wisconsin, our legislators, our Congress, and our House of Representatives aren't standing up and doing what the people are demanding of them to do, which is to reverse this illegal mandate. And I was frustrated by this. I'm like, why aren't they doing it? I read one article that was saying that they're waiting for um, civilians to, to um, take this to do a civil action lawsuit, a um, civil rights civil action lawsuit against the governor to take them out of the hot seat. But what citizen, we can hardly even make it, most of us, not all of us, but we're struggling already the way it is because we can't go to work or our work is slowed to this whole COVID mess. And now you want to put the burden, the financial burden of this lawsuit to get the laws to be the way they should be when that's their job that's why we pay tax money for them to do that so you can kind of see I was getting all undone about this the other day I was really mad about it and so I was like Lord man I'm just I I want to fight this in the spirit but I don't know what to say over it so I started to pray in the spirit right because when you don't know what to do that's how you get your mind that's how you facilitate single-mindedness you get the mind of Christ 
from your spirit into your natural mind. So I was just praying in the spirit about this whole thing that I just was so frustrated about. And I was scrolling through Facebook, and there was, not at the same time, this was a little bit later, and there was a, an ad for Rick Renner, not an ad, whatever. For his page, he just released a new book about the signs of the end times. Now, I ordinarily maybe probably wouldn't have even thought anything of it, but something jumped out that I felt like I needed to pursue that. I needed to listen to his messages about this topic, and I needed to read it. Well, now that I'm reading it, I understand that's what, that what's happening is totally prophetic. It's totally setting the stage for where our world is going. And so now I understand my proper place in this whole thing and why things are happening the way they are and to not get so undone about what's happening because I can't stop it. I mean, I, we can stop it in the spirit, of course, and we can move at, according to the spirit, but we have to know what the will of the Lord is. If I pray against the will of the Lord in this situation, I'm not going. I'm going to spin my wheels. I'm not going to get anywhere. And, and you know, when you know, like you're saying, the prophetic of where we're going, then you can walk in peace in that because you exactly. know it's been already prophesied. Right. So, so he has a book out right right now called that I'm reading called um, um, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy, <laughs> and he's talking about all these weird conspiracy theories that are going around, like this idea of the mandated vaccine and that they're going to put microchips in the vaccine and then that that microchip is going to be the mark of the beast. Well, he addresses that and he says that all sounds good. But it's scripturally inaccurate because the mark of the beast does not come out until after the Antichrist is revealed and that is after the rapture of the church. And you cannot receive the mark of the beast without making a premeditated free will decision to receive it. Because that's what condemns you to hell, right? If you receive the mark of the beast. So they can't slip it in a vaccine and give it to you as a mandated vaccine without your consent because that's not, that's not how the story is written. We have to follow the script. Right? So then I was like, oh, right, okay. Not that I had fear about microchips and vaccines and all. I mean, I mean, I was, it's concerning a little bit, but um, the idea that they can force it on you, they can't. So, and you have to know the proper order of when these things happen. So now when I'm starting to learn, all these things that are happening right now are absolutely setting the stage for the, the new world order and the antichrist to come. It's gonna take, there's multiple stages of this needing to happen. And we're, the good news is, before it gets really nasty and before they start rolling out all the judgments, yep. we're going to be snatched out in the nick of time. That's so right. we don't have to be in fear, but we have to understand that we are entering in a time right now where, the, where Christians will be persecuted at very various levels. Now, the more you know the word and the more you know Psalm 91, it doesn't necessarily mean your life is in danger, but what, like, what I read in Luke, why? That's what? what I was just going to say. And that's where it goes full circle because it goes back to us testifying. That's right. That's right. When we're put in positions, like I testify a lot on Facebook. If anybody <laughs> follows me, I always have something to say. And I do not make a lot of friends. In love, though. Always in love. But I, 1 Corinthians 13. Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say that I necessarily always have, what's the word, uh, tact. I don't always. Well, it, says the, it says the Christians are going to be prosecuted. That's what they're doing right now. Absolutely. There's a pastor in California that they're trying to take, arrest him and take him to court right. because he said, screw yeah, also, you, we're having church. Also, uh, uh, churches scan whole services. You can only have so many people. Um, you can't sing in a church. You know, mm -hmm. They're persecuting the Christians. That's what they're doing. I saw an article of somebody that was scouting out churches. I think Pastor Jan posted it. Some lady who's going through Maine, it was, um, yeah, finding churches that were in non-compliance yeah. and reporting uh -huh. them. Yeah, I posted there, something like we, that too. We have, even locally here, we have people taking license numbers down. Oh my. <laughs> so. <laughs> right, so, so what? But we still have to hold the line. It's so important that this remnant of the church stays pure because we're gonna be the only voice of reason and truth. He, he talks about, um, Absolute truth, and I was hoping to play this part, but we're not going to get to it tonight. But if you want to go on on his YouTube channel, he has something about compliance and forced compliance in the last days and its purpose. And he talks about how, um, where was I going with this? Totally lost my train of thought. Um, forced compliance. I think we're smart spider webbing now, so. Yeah, we are kind of. That's fine, <laughs> We are kind of. That's all right. But you, you, you hinted about they wanted civilians to bring this lawsuit oh, yes. against our government. Yeah. That's and you're saying that that's not the civilian's job to right. do it. It's their job. They've been elected to it. But all you got to do is look at 
where where those people are at in as far as being reelected. That's what right now you got two Republicans that are supposed to be leading the charge, and one of them sitting on his hands because he's up for reelection. So he's he's afraid to stand up. But That's as this gets worse and as this gets worse, we'll stand out brighter and brighter because as Christians walk in peace, they'll be looking and saying, how can you have all this load of peace? When everyone, as, right. the, as the times get worse and worse, they'll be like, I mean. You know where we're going. <laughs> right. And then well, how, how can you be peaceful? How can you can be joyful? How come you're smiling? What's going on in your life? You know? Mm-hmm. You even, Ellie, you even got like the guy that's in your district. He speaks up. But Steinke? He, I, I don't know his name. It's either Steinke or Cowles, and Cowles doesn't do anything, no. so it's got to be Steinke. Or, mm-hmm. but, but I just lit him up the other day in an email. Mm-hmm. Not like attacking him, but just yeah. saying. But uh, he comes out, he speaks, uh, but he can't do anything. They can call an emergency session of Congress. They absolutely can. Any one of but them can if they get a majority can, vote. Yeah, he, they could if they got a number of them to go along with it. Mm-hmm. We already have laws on the, on the books that say wear masks in public or... It's illegal anyways. But we have, Autogamy County, we got Tom Nelson, who's the executive of Autogamy County. He's backtracked from what he what his originally thinking is. Now he's falling in line with Avers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, he, he was elected on his, what he stood for. Now he's not doing the job what he said he would do. Mm-hmm. So this idea of forced compliance, I don't, necessarily know where I was going with that, but I'll just bring it back to say that um, this idea of tolerance and acceptance, how the devil is using people who tend to be more progressively minded to say that if you aren't tolerant and if you aren't inclusive of alternate lifestyles, for example, that you are um, not showing the love of Christ because God loved everybody. That's a message I hear all the time. How can yeah. you call yourself a Christian? Yeah. God says you're supposed to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That means being tolerant and inclusive of alternate lifestyles. Well, the, the truth of the word of God says if, if you were created a male and you have a penis, then guess what? You're a male and you don't have the, the um, yes, you can do whatever you want. You have a free will, but you can't change your anatomy and become a female. You are created to be a male. You know what I always say with that? If you take a bolt and a nut, you have two nuts, they're totally useless. They do nothing for you. You take two bolts, they do nothing for you. But if you have a bolt and a nut, then you have something functional. That's right. You, this sounds like, a, sounds like a little bit of an engineer's mind. <laughs> right. So in the last days now, where the Christians are persecuted, right, you'll be, if you hold the line and if you speak truth and you walk, you are the light and you are the salt of the earth, when somebody asks you, do you, do you accept homosexuality, right. for example, you're obligated, if you are a part of the remnant church in the last time, you are obligated to say, homosexuality is not acceptable according to the word of God. Now, do I judge the person or hate the person who chooses homosexuality? No, I love the person. But I have to say that the Bible, the perfect standard of the word of God, defines homosexuality as wrong. Mm-hmm. Just like he defined a male body having a penis and a female body having a vagina that's god's definition of a man and god's definition of a woman and just because we don't like how we were created doesn't mean we can change it so that's this this whole idea of um the whole purpose like what i read in luke is when you are put under the gun what the expectation is for you to do is to hold the line and Mm -hmm say that this is what the truth is yeah. mm-hmm. because it's being clouded and there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians that have no root in the word and they right. can't even answer some of these questions like that quiz that we handed out a few weeks ago remember that mm-hmm. quiz what we took yep. um, there's many many people that I know personally that would have no idea how to answer most of those questions I have a question yeah. <laughs> okay so with everything that's going on where do you draw the line where do you say we're not going to we're not going to follow those rules because in the Bible they didn't always go with like civil authority mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Like where do you say I'm a Christian and God's word says I have to stand up for what's right according to the Bible mm-hmm. and all of this stuff that's going on isn't all right. When do you say enough's enough and we stand up for 
You know what I'm, do you understand what I'm saying? Can I answer? do, and I, I mean, it's a broad question. It covers know, a lot I of things. How to... So I feel like for me, I just have to pray in the spirit. For example, we know that there's the law of the land and we're expected to obey the law of the land, but then we also know that there's the word of God. And sometimes the law of the land does not coincide with the word of mm -hmm. God. So when we come to these injunctions, we have to make a decision. Am I going to be civilly disobedient in honor of the word of God? Or am I going to obey the law of the land you know, for whatever reason. I'll give you an example. Today I went to a funeral, posted on the door before I went in, said, masks required. And all the kids said, oh, I guess we can't go. And I said, oh, we're going. If they turn us away from this funeral because we're not wearing a mask, then I guess we're not going to the funeral, but we're going to go in. Because, because the mask mandate is not a law. That's it right. is not a law. It is a mandate that the government says, this is, or the governor said, this is my recommendation. So it, I looked at that and I said, well, we are exempt from that law or this mandate. So we are going to go. And if anyone questions us, we can tell them that we're exempt and we don't have to give them a reason. We can say we're exempt. And so um, I went in, probably 70% of the people had masks on. My sister sat right next to me with a mask on and I looked at her like, really? But that's her personality. She's a more compliant person. I will always stand on principle. And I can tell you that most of the people in there that know me personally, fully expected that I walk in without a mask because that's who I am. So, Amen. <laughs> so to answer your question, I feel like you just have to go with your convictions and that's why it's important to pray in the spirit because you may go into a situation, I went to the library the other day, same situation, the mat, the, the, yeah. um, it was posted that you couldn't go in without a mask. Now I had an appointment to be there, but it said you couldn't go in without a mask. Now I was at another place where I had to work this through. I had all four kids with me. We had, um, I think 90 minutes was our, our time and I had to get two books for each kid in 90 minutes. This is a very challenging task. This is like a, ch this is like I should be on a game show challenge. You know those game show challenges? Mm -hmm. Remember that one with the grocery store and you had to like run through the store yeah. and grab certain items? That's what it felt like. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, do I challenge this mask mandate? Because I'm going to have to challenge it with the lady sitting at the desk, and then any librarian yeah. that I deal with, I'm going to have to have the same conversation with them. Or do I go in for the intended purpose, get what I need, and get out? And I decided in that moment, although my convictions are to challenge this, due to the circumstance of me having four kids, and I have a very short timeline, and I have to meet this deadline, we're all going to put on a mask, we're going to go in, we're going to get our stuff, and we're going to get out. But I explained to all the kids why we were doing that way, and that, and that if it was a life or death situation, if it was really important, I would do what I had to do. But in that moment, it was a time constraint. It was, I need to get in and get out. This is all the time I have. We're doing it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I was civilly disobedient in my, in my attitude. But I was going to say, see, in some right. things, like, you can go right or left on because it's not in the Word of God. But then right. there's other things in the Word of God that says do not steal, and it's cut clear and dry. You know what I mean? So with that, well, if somehow... The environment changed and tried to say that you needed to do something that was like steal. Well, we know it's wrong. Right. And, and so th the word says it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's cut and dry. So in that, it's so important to read the word and understand what the word says. Like today from Memphis, he, was, he did hockey today at a different rink. And we just walked in there with no mess. And he, whoever was running it said something. I said, well, he's exempt. He goes, well, this isn't for him then. And like, according to the mandate, he's supposed to be able to participate. So he was all negative about it. So Memphis went back out and um, I said, well, they're requiring masks. You don't have to do it or you just put it on, just don't wear it on your nose. And he's like, well, I still want to do it because it was only an hour. So he wore it like this. So mm -hmm. it's not like he really fully complied. No. He just partially complied so mm -hmm. he can do what he loves to do. Well, I'm, both of the boys broke their straps off within 10 minutes of their mask. They just pulled them right off because they were slingshotting them at each other. <laughs> I just did it because it was all soggy and gross when he came out. Like, oh, and I, we did yeah. get stopped by a librarian. I, I, I didn't have them wear it over their, no their noses either. Right. But at one point, I, I was standing at the little thing where you look up the number for the book, and I was talking to Hannah, and she could not understand a word I was yeah, saying. Right? So I yeah. pulled it down, and I said, go into this aisle and get <laughs> number 745 on the bottom, or whatever I said to her. And the librarian was right there. Is there a reason that you are not wearing your mask? Oh. And I said, my nine-year-old daughter can't understand me. So I had to pull it down so I could talk to her. And she was like, oh, oh okay, okay. And she didn't <laughs> bug me the rest of the day. But she kept her eye on those boys. Oh. But I tell you, I mean, 
Okay, you can babysit them then, and you can get them a new mask every time they rip that thing off and break it, because I don't care. I have right. to get my books. You deal with them. See, at Goodwill the other day, we walked in there without our masks, and they stared at Memphis all the way down. They even sent their manager to pretend he was looking at the clearance rack. I'm like, really? Yeah. Because we walked in there without new masks. Like, Nobody questioned you? Oh, yeah, we got stopped by two people. I said, we're exempt. And they're like, what about that one? I'm like, he's also exempt. And they just stared. And they didn't ask why. Nope. I went to phone them anyway. They can't. Yeah. Well, they believe. Okay. Ask you why. They're not even it's supposed to be it's saying anything no. when you don't wear one. Right. They're supposed to automatically assume that you have a medical exemption yeah. when you walk in without a mask. Wish I could do that at work. Me too. But I went to two places, festival and dollar store. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to go in without a mask. And I went to both places without a mask. And no one said a word. And I went back out. Mm -hmm. I went into Kohl's. And they asked me if I needed a mask. And I said, nope. And they said, well, you're supposed to wear, I, I understand, I, I don't need one, I'm not going to be wearing a mask, or however I said it, I'm exempt, whatever. I didn't lie, but I just said I'm exempt, or I, whatever. And he, he, he backed off right away and said, okay, we just have to ask, and I have to warn you that you're putting yourself at risk. I understand, thank you. I'm just going to return something, I'll be out in a minute. Mm -hmm. Queen Farm wanted me to take a mask. He was excuse me, do you need a mask? I'm like, no, thank you. Yeah. I have acquired immunity. Would you like me to do a blood assay? I know. I think it went through our house already anyway last last so winter. Even like <laughs> the election voting on Tuesday. So they, yeah, they said you have to have a mask on. So I said, Okay, I'll put the mask on. So I went in there and um I go up to the ladies there at the desk most time. They got older ladies there that don't know what's going on anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to identify you by an, uh, with a driver's license. Uh, driver's license to prove who you are. So I did it on purpose. I pulled this <laughs> thing way out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's pointing to your driver's license. So I leave my driver's license there. And then she goes, say your name. I said my name. And she's looking and looking. And she looks at driverless, she's looking at me, she's looking at driverless, looking at me, because I got the mask way up a little <laughs> part of my glasses oh. here. <laughs> and I, uh, I did it on purpose. Oh. So after about five minutes, I says, I'm right there. <laughs> I pointed my name on the book. <laughs> That's me right there. I says, even though you can't tell who I am. <laughs> so, you get a little sad. So she oh. gave me the balance. <laughs> but then there was, there was three people in there working that didn't have masks on. But they insisted when you first came on that you had to have a mask. I had read reports of people saying that if they refused to wear a mask, they had to vote outside and then have someone deliver their ballot in, yeah. and they couldn't see. So in that situation, I'm going to put a mask on because I'm going to watch where my ballot goes. That's so, right. so there are s situations where you just have to discern. Mm -hmm. Is this a time for me to stand up, or is this a time for me to do? What's the, the better of two evils, if you will? You know what I mean? I was Pick tempted to, you know, I was... <laughs> Probably being pretty nasty when I went there. Yeah, I was. Like you were a little sassy. I was tempted. I was tempted to. You know, they said, "Well, you want to vote on one of those machines there?" I says, "No, I want the paper ballot in my hand." Because I says, "That person that's telling you on how to run a machine there is probably a Democrat." And I says, "I'm not voting Democrat." <laughs> <laughs> I did have an attitude. And see, that's my point. I guess that's what you call, could call what I had to. Yeah, I did. I, I stormed out of hockey today. But Memphis is like, and I didn't treat anybody poorly. No, no, no. But I, my blood was boiling. Yeah. yeah. I know. And that's, you know, it's kind of like, is this a Christian way of going this way? But, you know, it's like, no, don't mess with me. I pulled my mask up because I had it up so high and my glasses were all fogged up. <laughs> <laughs> What's time? Oh, we got to cut it there. Okay, we'll read about human faith next time. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Oh, thanks, Siri. There you go. All right. Um, Good conversation. Communion, please, from our handsome usher this evening. Would you like to show everybody your hat? I like that. I saw that. I like that hat. Where'd you get it? You ordered it? Oh, Ellie got it for me. Oh. I got one that says Trump train on, train on. <laughs> yeah, Trump train. Trump train. I should get a message that for Packer games if, I, if we even have a season. They don't. They, well, I'm hoping you don't. No, I'm going to watch. 
I don't even want to go work at this. We've been having fun up, up north. We put our, our Trump flag on the boat. Yeah. And we get so many people hollering at us, waving at us, honking their horns. Yeah. Now they're all copying us. Yeah, that's true. that's okay. That's we need that all the advertising that's we can get. Right. There's flags now. People are putting them on their yeah. at the end of their docks and on their houses. So. Yeah, there's a guy it, over on County Trunk Avenue. He's got he's got a sign out Trump. Honk your horn. <laughs> do you honk? Sure. <laughs> Rule out. That's a good idea. We should do that. We get a lot of traffic by our house. Mm -hmm. We gotta have a honk parade all day long. <laughs> In the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, we'll do communion first, and then we'll do the offering. Mm -hmm. If you're a bread breaker, you can break bread in remembrance of the body of Jesus that was broken for you, that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. Mm -hmm. Receive that. Amen. Amen. That's all you need for COVID. That's all you need for SARS and MERS and what else? Swine flu, H1N1, the blue product, Zika, malaria, Ebola, and the next one, because the Bible says it's not plagues. There's going to be, as soon as we get over this one, there's going to be another one. So yeah. just Amen. understand that you got your medicine right here. That's right. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood that provided eternal redemption and salvation that we can live the rest of our life, prancing around in heaven with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right by you. If you have a tither and offering this evening, you can plunk it in. Does anyone have a testimony you'd like to share? Aaron, no. I feel like you had a Love testimony. Freedom. What? Didn't you have a testimony? No. Yeah, you went to the bank wearing a bandana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over. It's <laughs> only take a second, I said. It'll only take a second. <laughs> That's your best shot, I would say. They can't say it's a crime. I'm wearing a, a mask. Right? But literally, your best shot. What's that? <laughs> oh, don't you get him going. Name, right? Literally, <laughs> the best shot. <laughs> was that a, a reference to the song? Because he would have just busted out. I was, I was balling him out for something today. And I think... Every uh, every time I pause for a comment, he just thought of a song lyric to throw back at me to try to get me to back down. And I was like, really? See? What that? Oh, am I supposed to pray over these? Sure. Um, well, I I speak to you in Jesus' name, and I call you to prosper and multiply. Yes. In Jesus' name, go do your thing. Amen. Amen. It's done. Amen. Yep. That's all I gotta do. Because I, I don't have to believe in my heart. I just believe the authority of the word. Right. Amen. All I have to do is speak the word. The word does the work. Amen. So it doesn't matter how much faith or unbelief I have over that situation because the authority of the word works, right? Yep. Right. Um, any testimonies? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody? Really? Nothing? I'm glad my Bible study is producing fruit in your lives. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Our Bible study. Collectively. Anything back there, Lynn? I have a month to produce fruit. <laughs> I'm going to wash it. She's thinking. Oh, the wheels are spinning. Mm -hmm. I have a healing one. Oh, I shouldn't say just the healing one. This is very short. Here you go, Lynn. Right here is the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up Sunday morning. Well, I went to bed Saturday night, and I was just fine. And I woke up Sunday morning. And I had a sty and my eye was shut. I mean, it was puffed and it was shut. So I thought, oh, I don't want to go to the doctor for this. So I talked to it a couple times and it went away on its own in a couple of hours and it was gone. Amen. Right. Amen. You just speak Amen. to it. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing. Can't see. We, like I told you, went to a funeral today and Joel was, Joel's still at the stage where he's like processing and trying to figure this all out. And so he, he, he learned a lot today about funerals and what happens when you die and what's going to happen in the rapture. And we were talking about, you know, the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. So even though her body is all in ashes in that little, you know, jar up on the table, the cool thing is when the rapture happens, God's going to come down in his elevator and we're, and we're all going to hop on and go for a ride. But the cool thing is, God, before we can get on, those of us who are still alive and in faith, 
all the people that have already died, God has to take their bodies out of the grave, or in this case, out of this big jug of ashes, put them all back together into a person so their spirit can come back into their body, and then we can go up. How is that going to work, Joey? Oh, he had lots of great ideas on how that was going to work. <laughs> got, kid's got a big imagination. It was pretty cool to just like, talk about, he's like, why are people sad in here, Mom? And I said, well, if you were at my funeral, you'd, would you be sad? And he's like, well, I guess a little bit, but I, I know that you're, I know where you are, and I'll see you. I mean, like, he had the eternal perspective that a lot of people sitting in those chairs yeah, yeah. didn't have. I mean, our whole family, in this whole role, it was me and the kids, and Lindsay and Adam, and Charlotte and Emma, and, all that, and Mark and Rita, so this whole line. And we were all, it's hard for me to contain my joy in a funeral if I know that the person that died is born again and went to heaven because uh, I know what they're experiencing right now. Yeah, right. I'm so excited for them. Am I sad for the people that you know are going to miss them in the flesh? Sure I am, and I'm compassionate and I have empathy towards that. But I can't sit there and cry because I know that they are, they are not watching their own funeral. They could care less what we're doing right now. Right. Right. And so I was kind of giving Rita that perspective um, when the day that her sister died, I happened to be with her. And I said, I know that you're flesh wants you to get sad right now, but I want you to just keep the focus on what was her will. It was her choice, and she wanted to walk away from this life and graduate to the next one. You can't make this about you and how you feel about it. You right. have to keep the focus on her and what was her desire, and this is what she wanted, and you have to understand what she's experiencing right now and shift your perspective from what you have to deal with with the funeral arrangements to what is her life experience right now. What does she look like? Pull out the most youthful picture you can find of her. That's what she looks like right now. And so when we were talking about that, she tends to let her emotions, she likes to be in her emotion more times. But she did really, really well the last couple of weeks in the funeral. She just did great. And everybody in my row, we were all just like trying to not be too, you know, like you try not to laugh out loud, you know, when you're in a funeral. Because out of sensitivity for other people, you don't want them to think that you don't care. But coming out of the funeral, Hannah said, Mom, don't you care that Mimi's sister died? And I'm like, well, what do you mean do I care? And, and she's like, well, you just acted like you didn't care. And I'm like, well, I don't care. I mean, I don't take the care of her death. Yeah. I recognize that the people, there are people in there hurting, but I know where she is, and that's where I'm excited about. Is she's, she beat us there, man. She's experiencing yeah. eternity right now. Your mom was doing fine up until the knuckle bumps and the high fives, right? And she was like, wait now, hold on. Allie, what's going on? <laughs> but I think that... What I observed is that all the other people there were really pulling from our energy. Even though they weren't saying it, everyone wanted to come talk to us. Everybody wanted to be near us. Everybody was commenting on how, how the kids were just beautiful family and beautiful children and they're just so such a joy. Well, they don't even know my kids yeah. <laughs> well enough to make those assumptions, you know, to make, yeah. but they were just feeding off of that energy yeah. and that yeah. love and that joy. Right. So, anyway. All right then. Go forth and be blessed. See you next week. Same bat channel, same bat time.